Well, thank you for the invitation to speak at Rural Business. Um, today, we're going to talk about changing the paradigm on how to train robots. So first of all, a little bit about myself. Uh, I do neural modeling, so I'm not the other Versace that does uh, that other kind of modeling. I was born and raised in Montfalcone, Italy, which is a coastal town in the north of the country. Uh, I ended up studying artificial intelligence a lot. So I, uh, I gained a couple of PhDs, one in Italy and the other one at Boston University, where I ended up uh, then developing my career, founding the Neuromorphic Lab with a few colleagues. Um, over the course of my career, I worked with a number of agencies ranging from uh, uh, NSF to the Air Force to DARPA and NASA with the goal of building brain-inspired uh, real-time learning algorithms that are you know, kind of different from the traditional AI algorithm in that they are inspired by the way uh, the brain works. And uh, uh, out of uh, this research, I co-founded Neurala initially in 2006 uh, to contain some patents, but really the company came out in 2013 in the uh, Techstar Accelerator program. And for three people, uh, we grew it today to about 50. Um, so we've worked a lot in the field, uh, many, many, many years. And uh, today we, we are proud to say that we have uh, successfully de deployed our artificial intelligence in about 45 uh, million devices. And so really, the uh, topic is about what did we learn from uh, this successful application, some of which in, in robotics and drones, and what did we learn from the unsuccessful one? So can we come up with a recipe of uh, uh, do's and don'ts uh, related to how to build artificial intelligence into successful deployed uh, robotic application? So I live in Boston, and I came from uh, Boston to the Bay Area. Um, throughout the trip, uh, despite uh, you know Boston and the Bay Area are two of the areas where uh, the, there is uh, uh, the you know notable uh, robotic uh, research and deployments, I didn't see any of these robots around in any real practical application. So it seems that um, there is a gap between what we see on YouTube in terms of uh, you know uh, robot that do various tasks from the entertaining to the useful to our day-to-day -day reality. And many people today talk and spend time, you know, focusing on issues such as um, uh, Asimov drove robotics. But the truth is that this is not really the problem that we are facing today. And uh, if you allow me to get biblical for a second, I would say, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. So what's today's trouble in robotics is that they don't work. Right, so that's that's the biggest trouble that we have. It's it's useless to focus on, uh, you know, robotic laws if the robots that we're actually building don't don't really work. And so, what is the main issue? Well, there is a, a a mismatch between what people expect from robots, which is essentially to be as smart and as useful and as dexterous as as humans or at least as animals, and the reality, which uh, is that robots are brittle, rigid, and they tend to be non-adaptive. So thankfully, uh, researchers like myself have spent many, many, many years researching artificial intelligence and in particular how the brain works. And so bridging the gap between what our expectations are, which is essentially human-like behavior, and what can be done today with artificial intelligence. So over the course of many decades, uh, researchers have cracked uh, as, as, as much as possible the code of, of the brain and neurons and network of neurons that comprise the brain and eventually give rise to behaviors that are useful in, in, in robots. So there is enough today uh, to design artificial intelligence inspired by the way robots behave, uh, in, by the way humans behave, to, to, to move it into, into robots. So I will talk about three main issues that prevents us to fulfill these uh, artificial intelligence in robotic frames. And I like to split them up in, into these three main categories. The first one is AI, easy peasy. So there is an attitude versus leaving AI to the, towards you know, the end because it's easy to do. The second one is uh, the training regimen that we undertake when, when building robotic application. And the third one is sort of a, uh, the, the misunderstanding of what is the right uh, balance between humans and robots when building a, a self-contained deployable robotic application. So let's look at the first. AI is it easy? Well, uh, I like to, to think of uh, uh, effective robotic application as solving simultaneously three main class of problems. And they call this the body, the, ba the brain, and the mind. So the body is to build effective robotic bodies, which are chassis, actuators, sensors, and so forth. 
The second one is to equip them with the brain, which is the right uh, uh, computational medium for them to be able to process the information and, uh, and move around. And the third one is the mind, which is uh, sort of the algorithm or the software that powers this robot. And so the usual attitude uh, for, for, from the robotic industry is, unfortunately, uh, is, to focus, is to leave the mind for, for the last, right? So let me focus on the, on, on, the, on the body. So spend a ton of time and money in designing the robotic body, and then we'll see about the mind. You know, it's, you know leave, leave it until the end. So this is a typical trajectory that we have seen over and over again over, you know, 15 years being followed by robotic companies. And the ones that don't follow this path are the one, the, the one more likely to succeed. So the first step is to spend a ton of time and money designing the body. And that's logical because a robotic company is primarily um, you know, intended to build a, a physical apparatus. And so they, they do that. And then they realize, well, we need kind of the AI part, right? And so, uh, and here's perhaps the most uh, dangerous step, which is, well, robotic companies are filled with very intelligent people. But sometimes they they are they think of you know themselves maybe too intelligent, uh, and and they say well you know we'll do it ourselves don't worry you know it's just AI, and so somebody gets pulled and crowned uh, their their AI guru and so then then he has to build the AI system so six months later, he's obviously stuck and say well give me another week and uh, three thousand six thousand three hundred eighty weeks later, the robot doesn't work and perhaps they they run out of money. So why is that so hard? Why is the guy stuck? Well, one uh, piece of uh, why this happens is actually the second, uh, you know, sort of a, a red flag that people should look at, which is how our robots train. So never underestimate the brain. Well, why shouldn't shouldn't we as underestimate the brain? Well, let's look just at um, what physiology tells us about the brain and the and the, and the intelligence that it produces. So if we look at the brain, it has about 2%, represents about 2% of the body weight, uh, but it uses about 20% of its energy. So something is going on there. Why is the brain consuming so much power with respect to the rest of the tissue? And the main uh, operation that the brain does, surprisingly perhaps for, for a few, is not only creating inferences or understanding what the, what the word is in front of it, but is learning constantly right so we don't learn once and for all and then we stop learning we learn constantly throughout our lifetime actually in every single second of our, of our life and if you look back at the title with this little icon here you remember i flashed you this image uh, about versace well many of you if not all of you will remember it and how come that you remember it because you have learned it so you didn't just look at it and understood it you actually incorporated that into your synaptic ways and so with my CTO, we actually went through the process of calculating how many times uh, a, a typical brain learns throughout a lifetime. So if we calculate that there are about 100 billion neurons and 500 trillion synapses in an average brain, and on average, we live for about 2 billion seconds, well, and also assuming that each neuron, which are the basic processing units in our brain, emits a spike per second, and the spike is you know, a typical event, a communication event, if you will, between two neurons, then, which is actually, by the way, a fairly conservative number, then the total number of learning events in a typical brain equals one septillion, which coincidentally seems to be the number of stars in the universe. So there is a staggering amount of learning going on in a typical human life, and that's why the brain eventually consumes so much power. Well, what do we do with robots? With robots, we don't do that. And that perhaps is the second biggest problem uh, in, in, in designing robots, as, as I was mentioning. And we realized this working with NASA many years ago when NASA asked us, well, we don't want, we, please design us an AI that enables uh, a robot such as the Mars rover to explore autonomously and learn in real time uh, in, in, when presented in a completely foreign environment. And so in that case, we looked at the AI available back then, which paradoxically is also the main AI that is built today. And uh, um, we had to come up with a completely different way to design our artificial intelligence that is more, you know, is a little bit closer to this idea of one septillion learning event 
uh, versus just learning once and forever. And so we looked at the traditional AI, which was rigid, fixed, relying on data set collected beforehand, and we had to come up with a completely different paradigm. And, and just to, just to, to put things into perspective, uh, traditional uh, DNN, or traditional AI, usually work like this. You collect a large uh, set of images, and then you learn that, you collapse the, the, the error function until it's satisfactory, and then you say, okay, this AI is ready. What if you need to add anything new? Well, you need to add the new data and then retrain on the whole data set and, and sort of do this cumbersome training over and over again, even if you had to add one single new thing. And in, in, con in, constant, in contrast, the, uh, DNA, the, the new technology we, have, we developed called LDNN or lifelong DNN, takes the approach more similar, more, more uh, the, uh, I would say, closer to how the brain really works in human and animals, which is continuous interleaved learning. So when you're perceiving a dog or perceiving a chair, you're actually learning it at the same time and refining your AI as it goes along. And so this technology is radically different, right? So conventional DNN take a long time to train, and then when they're trained, their AI is fixed, Whereas uh, this other kind of technology kind of learns very, very quickly. And here is an example of how we have productized this tech and eventually put it in many, many million devices, uh, making it run in, in a form factor that is as small as a, as a cell phone and be able to add knowledge continuously on the fly, pretty much like humans are able to do. So that's the big difference, right? So when we train robotic systems today, what we are doing is we are collecting a huge amount of data, showering the data to the robot all at once, and then the robot is done, right? So the robot is, is deployed versus this idea of continuous integration or continuous uh, development approach that, that is actually pervasive in the software industry, but hasn't made it yet to artificial intelligence. So the idea of building small incremental changes and then uh, redeploying and testing and, uh, and you know withdrawing in case the problem arises this paradigm that has worked so well uh, for the software industry hasn't made it yet in terms of formamentis or, or uh, workflow into artificial intelligence and when that happens i think the robotic application in particular will be the one benefiting the most from this continuous learning and, and the, um, iteration and refinement of ai the third point is uh, um, almost orthogonal, but extremely important to the other two, and has to do with the, uh, the idea of how people really conceptualize uh, an AI-powered robot versus the idea of a robot in collaboration with a human to solve a particular task. So let me give you an example here of a, a robot, uh, one of our customers called Badger, that has deployed uh, 550 robots in uh, uh, an equal number of grocery stores in the United States. So in this case, the robot is roaming around the grocery store, uh, continuously inspecting various things. And one thing that we have done with them is uh, enable the robot to detect spills on the ground. Um, and that's important to be able to clean the spills timely so that nobody falls and the insurance doesn't complain. So in order to do that, um, the company had um, human analyst looking constantly at millions of images per day. And what the AI that we developed with them does is to pre-screen uh, all these massive amount of images to um, present the human analyst with just a, a small subset of these images that, that contain pertinent, you know, very highly, very likely uh, uh, events of spills. So if you look at the whole system, which consists of three people, uh, the, the, the human worker in the grocery store, the robot, three people, sorry, two people and one robot, the human gro uh, worker in the grocery store, the robot and the human analyst, AI is sort of sitting in the middle, catalyzing and reducing the amount of time the analyst look, looks at images and, and, and the complex between analyst and robot reduces the time where the human worker has to look uh, for spills on the ground. And so overall, the result is that the human worker in the grocery store has more time to actually do what they're supposed to do, which is customer service, and the robot, in collaboration with AI, is able to reduce, you know, uh, the, 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 the occurrence of spills and, and clean them faster. So it's a, it's a very nice example of how the cost, the combination between human and robot work and AI works effectively to make a, a process more more uh, streamlined and effective. 
Another example fairly similar in terms of um, you know, conceptual framework is the idea of uh, drone inspections. So in this case, we are working with several customers in US and Europe to streamline the analysis of very large um, data sets of images collected from drones, in particular as they uh, fly around and uh, uh, help to inspect infrastructure such as wind turbines, uh, gas pipelines, electrical distribution, grids, and so forth. So in this case, again, the drone does the bulk of the uh, data uh, collection, and then the human analyst is supported by AI to uh, analyze just a very small subset of the images collected, which, which otherwise will take a, a very long amount of time of tedious work, and the AI sort of does that tedious part for the analyst and presents just the, the pertinent data. Similarly, the constellation of human and robot is very important, especially when working in situation where humans don't want to go. So in this case, the robot supplements the human in taking over one part of the task, in this case, it's uh, one of our customer in Labor Robotics, that is developing this robot for underground ground um, sort of um, scouting, in particular in disaster area, where the human basically unleashes the robot at a certain point to be able to understand what's hidden and what you know what's the status of, a, say, a collapsed uh, part of the city or, or, a, or a cave or an underground structure looking for survival or, or other potential hazards. And another uh, final application is uh, in manufacturing. So these are not traditional robots in the sense that, uh, you know, people don't think of industrial machines as robots, but in a sense, there are machines that are extremely automatic and they are starting to become more and more robotic and aware. In particular, as uh, uh, it becomes much harder for a uh, manufacturing company and their customers, the, the, the one that buy machines, to be able to find the uh, right people or the, the people who, are the, who have the desire to work in manufacturing, right? And so the, it, it's, get, it's getting harder and harder to hire in, in that sector. And the machine, as a consequence, need to become more human, if you will, to supplement this lack of uh, uh, human workers. And uh, one way to do it is to equip each machine with artificial intelligence that takes over the very tedious, very fast uh, pace requirements, for instance, of quality control where a human could not keep up possibly with the speed of a machine analyzing uh, you know, 24 seven uh, products coming out at 60 products per minute in a machine that uh, you know, works for 20 years uh, in a row minus one week of downtime per year for maintenance. So those situation, no human uh, should be wished to have a job, but uh, the job is still required. Therefore AI is plugged in, working collaboratively with humans. And so one human worker can oversee in much better working condition, uh, a variety of machines that just be presented by the AI, a, a subset of those images or those products that actually are problematic. So summarizing the three keys of um, you know, building AI power robotic application are first plan AI ahead. It's not an easy task, either build a large team internally or work with the company like Norala or others that are able to work alongside the, the, alongside the company to build AI applications that are actually successful very, very soon, don't leave it to the end. The second one is move away from the idea of training your AI once and then hoping for the best. The, the, the right mindset is AI is a continuously developing piece of software that has to be updated. And so your roadmap should include this, this methodology into, into, into its workflow. And the third one is perhaps something that you should think even beforehand, which is what is the real role of the robot vis-a-vis -vis all the other human components in the task. So design the robot, not with the idea that it has to do everything, but has to do enough so that the human is relieved of a crucial part of the, of the work. These are my contact information. Thank you again for the invitation and have a good day.